Welcome back, friends and family. Let's talk herbs. So this was an episode that almost wasn't. What do I mean by that? I want to thank Dave Colling for not only doing this interview once, but coming on twice to talk about breeding Brazilian rainbow boas. Uh, I've had technical difficulties. I had um, scheduling conflicts and then just user error on my part. And I'm so grateful for Dave for coming on and doing this interview twice. So I'm not going to keep you guys long. Before we jump on, here, check this out. These are the Patreon subscribers who really help make my channel uh, a possibility. So if you want to check that out, you can join in the links below. Also check out Dave Colling's own personal page, uh, Rainbow Reptiles. Um, Rainbows are us, reptiles. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the description as well. And, uh, and, and we'll check it out. So without further ado, if you missed the live uh, interview or if you just wanted to double check and, and check your notes and see if you missed anything, here it is. Dave Colling, How to Breed Brazilian Rainbow Bow. And that's it, folks. So welcome to a, um, another episode of Let's Talk Herps. Recently changed from Herp Panel Forum since I'm doing mostly interviews and not forums anyways. I, I figured it would be uh, good to reflect that. I have with us today for the third time uh, the nicest guy in Rainbow Boa is uh, Dave Calling. Uh, <laughs> I only say that because you, you've been gracious with us. We've had a lot of tech difficulties and uh, boneheaded moves by the host, this guy. Yeah, um, all and, stuff happens. It's, it's technology. A, you either love it or you hate it. And sometimes well, both. <laughs> yeah, sometimes both, right? <laughs> uh, so, so thank you so much for joining me for this. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dave Calling has been breeding Rainbow Boas for uh 30 years now right david and, and i thought um i was going to dip my toe into it this winter uh, and i couldn't think of anyone better to ask for guidance than dave and he was gracious enough to agree more than one time um and even better uh, he's joining us live to do this so thank you very much for for joining us live dave um this is uh hopefully going to be beneficial to those who are looking to breed rainbow boas either this season or or in the future so um you're welcome yeah, thank you. Now, the reason I, I decided to ask you on was because I have uh, I've checked out your website, rainbowsoreusreptiles.com, and uh, read the, the blogs and the, the articles you posted. And I wanted to ask you some clarifying questions and to kind of get an, a modern update, because I'm sure you've learned a few things in the, in the year since it was written. Um, yeah, it, it, it's an always evolving process. So, you know, the, 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 the write-up I did several years back on breeding rainbow boas is definitely down level from where I'm at today. I mean, it's a good start for anybody, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've changed a few things along the way. Yeah, right on. Um, so today, where are we at now? It's, it's October 19th. What are you mm -hmm. doing right now to prepare for uh, the, the upcoming breeding season or have you already started preparations? Where are you at right now? Well, for me, breeding multiple pairings and by multiple, we're talking, you know, in the range of 30 pairings yeah. um there's a lot of background work that needs to be done to figure out who's going to go with who and um at least in my case the logistics of, of recognizing i don't want to be moving animals zigzagging them around the males and females i want to take a block of males out and move them over to the block, same block of females in that same geographical similarities um but First, I need to figure out the pairings, which I haven't even done yet. Mm. Um, I've just had too much on my plate, so I haven't done that. But um, the other thing that goes on is we start the cooling process. And I have always cooled the entire selection of adults. So it's even though I females. haven't done my males and females. Um, so even though I haven't done my actual pairings and decided that and done what I call my annual mass migration, which is moving all the animals around to be in that geographical setup for mm -hmm. the coming year, um, I can still cool everybody at the same time. So even though I haven't done my, my pairing decisions, I mean, obviously some are forefront and it's like, okay, I'm gonna do this one for sure. But then there's always the, you know, what do I do to fill in the rest of the, the 30 spots? Cause it's not 30 spots of, oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna do that. No, it's, 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 you know, 10 or 20 of, you know, definitely going to do that and then figure out what to do with the rest. Um, but yeah, so I, I started my cooling literally today. Literally today. So what did, uh, how did you go about doing that? Uh, today, uh, I do this every year. And so I keep a record card every year. There we go. Um, and that starts off with, you know, where, where the temperatures on the thermostats are today, yesterday. 
Um, and then today being the first one, I drop at two degrees of day temperature and, and move it from two degrees of night drop to three degrees of night drop. So it started out my thermostats mainly are set at 82 with two degrees of night drop. So they went to 80 degrees with three degrees of night drop this week. Mm. Next week, I'll take it down one and one and continue to do that until I get it down to 77 with seven degrees of night drop. And are you finding that, is that where you're setting it at 77 or are you using like a temp gun to measure temps and that's the hot spot? That's where I set it. We do get some variation. And one of the reasons why um, I don't start until now is being in California. If I start that night drop any, if I start that temperature drop any sooner, it doesn't do any difference because the room's going to be, you know, above the the night drop temperature. So it doesn't even drop down. So again, we're looking to, to tie that in with the natural weather where you're at and get those, those night drops and cooler temperatures so that everything will cool off at night. And obviously when the thermostat goes into the night drop, it doesn't instantly go down to that, you know, right. Two, three, four, five, seven degrees cooler. It just stops heating. And so it slowly cools off overnight. And so, so let me ask, so where I'm at in, in California, just six hours probably away from you, um, we started getting temps in the, um, like I check in, in this room here with a, with a snakes are kept, overnight temps like around uh, the beginning of October were around uh, like inside 70 and in, in, in the high 60s. Do you wait till it's lower than that or what sort of temps are you looking for outside or in the snake room? Well, that, that, that'll bad. work well. You just need to have enough of a delta between the, the snake room temperatures and the snake cage temperatures that there's actually going to be some effect in the snake cage. Right. I mean, if you're talking, you know, 75 degrees in your room, you're not going to get 74 in the cage. You're not even going to get 75 in the cage when you shut it off because it's just going to slowly even out to the room temperature. Mm-hmm. But you definitely want to get to the point where the room itself can cool off. Gotcha. Um, one of the things I have is my house was built with a downstairs bedroom and that downstairs bedroom, they opted for what they call in-laws quarters, mm-hmm. which literally is insulation on all the interior walls as well as the exterior wall. So it works perfect for me. It keeps the, the room from heating up the house and keeps the house from heating up the room. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds really good. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So, so you're looking for... Uh, just enough temperature for the night drop to actually take effect. So when, right. I, when it was summertime or, or even early fall over here and it was 80 during the day inside the room and probably 74 at night, that wasn't going to get to anything. So it's, the cool side is going to be like 76 at the lowest in the, in the tank anyway, right? right? Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. So you, so you drop it down a week at a time and you said, um, what were the, the final temps that you were going for? Uh, I'm shooting for 77 with seven degrees of night drop. So 77 during the day and set at 70 at night. It rarely gets down to 70. Hmm. But that's kind of a temperature that allows it to drop as far as it's going to drop. I see. And that'll be yeah, mid-November before I get there. So by then, the, temp- the temps will have cooled off even more so. So it, it, some of it I'm anticipating where those temperatures are going to be. Uh, um, so I can start the night drop now and take advantage of that and get everybody, you know, primed and ready to go. Mm. And um, how, did, how did you find out these, these numbers? What, what the, when did you determine, oh, I'm gonna stop at 77? Uh, did it just one year that's where you went and it worked or? Well, I just, I've, I've been doing this and evolving it over the years and that's kind of where I've settled out and, and what, what's working for me here in California with the temperature I have and the room I have and all that stuff. The thing that that I always tell people Mm. is regardless of what you're doing with the animals, it's going to be tied to your own individual parameters in your house and your town you live in and so on and so forth. I mean, you're not going to be able to do exactly the same as someone else does. I mean, I keep my rainbow boas on paper. Um, Very few people can get away with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I get away with it because I have so many and the whole room stays humid. So there's not this drying out of the cage, if anything, the cage that I, I put new vapor in and it's dry and it gets moister as the as the day goes on, just from the humid humidity in the air in the entire room. With the paper, how often do you find yourself uh, having to change out the paper? Uh, at least weekly. Yeah, and is that just is it from the humidity or just from uh, the the waste mostly? 
well, waste mostly, but yeah. Then, and of course, as soon as they leave waste, then it starts to, to uh, uh, become less than pleasant. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of challenges that uh, that you face, um, or maybe not necessarily challenges at this point, because you've got a routine down, that aren't going to apply to to so uh, so many keepers out there, because you have a few more rainbow bows, I think, than than the majority of keepers. But uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff that overlaps. What about um? So now that you've got them cool, and like you said, it's, it's going to be around November once we reach that temp, how long do you keep them cooled for? Um, I drop them down, keep them at the cool temp for about a month, month and a half. And then I just do the reverse process and weekly raise those temps back up. Hmm. And as we're going through that cooling cycle, somewhere around the November, December timeframe, um, I, and this is, again, this is, you know, kind of new information that I've come up with. Um, I'm watching the males uh, more than anything else. I'm watching the males and see what the males are doing because the males will start to drop sperm plugs. Mm -hmm. And when the males start to drop sperm plugs, that, in, in my opinion, from my experience, is the females are putting off the pheromones that says, I'm ready. And so the males are getting all excited and having that premature excitedness. And, you know, they start dropping sperm plugs like they're you know they're looking for this female that they can they can sense smell mm -hmm. um but they can't get to her because obviously they can't get out of their tub so as soon as i start to see the males dropping sperm plugs that's my signal to okay it's time let's start the process and that's when the the mass mi male migration moves from their tubs to the female tubs that's interesting let me ask you a question um for for keepers like me who have real messy cages like that with a bunch of dirt and plants and things like that. Do you normally find that they will drop the sperm plugs in the water or do they do it on the ground? Because anytime I've seen them, it's always been in the water. But I don't know if that's just because I can't see them elsewhere, you know, I'm missing them. I don't know that they drop them out of the water. I have seen a few out of the water like yeah. yourself. Um, I don't really notice them out, out of the water on the paper, but that they very well could be. But that's what I'm looking for is in the water bowls. Okay. Um, they do tend to uh, be in the water quite a lot, um, just nothing different from the rest of the time of the year. Um, I think even with the cooling temperatures, they may actually retreat to the water to, to um, stay a little warmer because the water's warmed up and it cools off a little slower than the cage. That makes sense. Um, and uh, so what, what do you do and how do you do that? How do you introduce them? And folks, by the way, if, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I'll bring them up either at the appropriate time or, or at the end. So uh, feel free to chat them up and, and, and I'll bring it up to Dave. But uh, Dave, um, what are you doing? When, so let's say it's uh, December 3rd. You notice the male puts sperm plugs in. Um, what do you do? Do you just pick them up and move them over? What's the Literally process just like pick them up, move them over, and, and, and repeat until done. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with that 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 similar geographical layout, it, it doesn't take me long to move the you know the 30 males, 20, 30 males into the into the 30 female cages. Um, the other thing that happens is I do also breed some of them in trios. Um, and those that are bred in trios, there is a pass-through that I cut between the cages, pass-through mm -hmm. hole that has a plug. Um, and then I, I remove that plug and introduce the male and uh, to the trio and and keep an eye on things for a little while because I have had uh, some males, some male and females just, you know, go right at it and they're, they're fine and happy. I have also had some, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say fighting, but they're definitely pushing and shoving against each other to the point where I actually had um, one break a water bowl, one pair wow. break a water bowl. And then proceed to mate in the broken glass. Okay. <laughs> no damage that I ever saw, but it was it was kind of comical when you think about it in the background. You know, afterwards, it's like okay, they shatter a glass bowl okay. and then they make in, mate in the shards. It's a bit of an aggressive event for the two of them, I think. Yeah, and and that specific pairing um, was done, you know, multiple times, and they were just aggressive every time. And I'm sure that's just, that's the two of them that, you know, that they liked it rough. Um, so I learned to rearrange that specific cage such that the water bowl was on the floor instead of up on top of the hive. So they couldn't push it off. 
Yeah, yeah. It was already on the floor. Eric called it a barroom brawl, but uh, Eric, I don't know if, uh, if we all go to the same kind of bars where after <laughs> after the fight they uh, they breed in the water bowls <laughs> over the glass. Um, what what makes you decide uh, on a trio versus just a, a straight male to female pair? Um, I intentionally don't have enough necessarily enough males to do thirty pairings, um, and so and some of that is it, it's all genetics. It's all what you're planning on doing. You know, you have a really nice high color male where you don't want to um, commit it necessarily to just commit him to just one female. Uh, in the past, I have actually successfully bred a male to four females in a year. Um, I decided not to do that because I got everybody was related. There's too many babies all half related to each other. Right. Um, but yeah, so they, they will definitely you know breed more than one female a year. So and, and when you do that, did you did you have all the did you have them in a big group like a anaconda breeding ball or or was it? Uh, yeah, it was all one big group. I my older cages had had pass-throughs on the outside tubes, pipes, uh, mm -hmm. four-inch pipes attached to the outside of the cages that I could link all the cages together. And so there was four breeding cages linked together with a male um, and four females. And he actually impregnated all four females and had, I think it was 83 babies. Oh, um, yeah. One male. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. Uh, and then next, the next year, he didn't produce anything. No, kind of warm now. Yeah, he was exhausted. I don't. He's he's got a lot of child support to pay. <laughs> he was he was still he was still smoking his cigarette. <laughs> yeah, 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 or yeah, the congratulatory cigars. He's a uh, he didn't run out of them yet. What uh, we've got a question from uh, from Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Uh, she wanted to know: Is there any particular reason you introduce the male to the females enclosure versus moving the female? Um. No specific reason other than the females were, are going to be in uh, a more of a cage environment, whereas the males are in a, a tub environment. And I don't like breeding in tubs. I want to be able to see what's going on. I don't want to. I don't want to pull the tub and make the earth move just to see what's going on. Um, I've tried that in the past, and it, it, I've been successful at breeding in the tubs. I just personally don't like it because I feel like I'm, I'm disturbing them to check on them as opposed to just. Uh, looking in the window, maybe even shining a light, doesn't they don't seem to care. How important is it to not disturb them? Is that something that keepers run into problems with? Is shining a light, flashlight on too much or opening up the door when they're you know trying to, to breed? Is that is that I, something that you hear about? I haven't found too much of an issue with that. It's just I my own personal thoughts are I wouldn't want you know the earth to move underneath them while they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and, yeah. and for them to get distracted by it. Um, I check on them frequently. Um, more often than not, I find them mating. I'll open up the door and I'll snap a picture or two and close the door and leave them alone. They don't doesn't seem to bother them. Yeah. Um, but again, I wouldn't pick them up and move them. I would definitely leave them to do what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we hear enough about snakes that get even uh, too disturbed to eat, you know, from doors opening and, and being handled. So uh, I think that's pretty sound logic to follow and just leave them alone. Um, we, uh, what do you do with the temperature once the snakes are put together? Like, so you'd mentioned that uh, you, you, you just leave them in there, right? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they'd either be in separate cages during this cooling process, or they'll be together during the cooling process. Um, it won't happen right away, but when, again, once that the males start, start dropping sperm plugs, and that doesn't mean all the females are ready, that means some female is ready. Right. And I don't necessarily know which one. Um, and I don't want to miss that opportunity and have her, you know, go through cycling, um, ovulating, and not have a male there to impregnate her. No, I want the male to be there to impregnate her. So um, I'll put them all together and I'll notice activity out of several, but not all. And then some I'll notice activity later. And, you know, some I never notice any activity at all. So, I mean, the female either didn't go or, you know, whatever. And, and, and I, really don't expect to get babies out of every litter. It's more of a put it put for me, put enough of them together and then I'll have plenty of litters and plenty of babies and and hopefully it'll be what I want at the end. That makes sense. And, and that's what what rate, what's your success rate like, would you say? It's probably around 50 to 60 percent. Okay. Um, some years better, some years worse. 
I think that's the uh, for a lot of a, a good sort of word of caution for a lot of people to uh, to to think about. I mean, I, I I'm pairing up one one pair of snakes, and I'm uh, I'm very excited about it. And I'm you know thinking like, okay, well, when do I do this and that sort of thing? But there there's I have to keep reminding myself there's a almost a what like you said a forty to fifty percent chance that there won't even be a litter just based on the odds, uh, let alone the fact that you know it's the first time and all the mistakes that go along with that so um, and yeah first time females first time even first time males tend yeah. to have a lower um return lower percentage than the, the 50 to 60 um it just happens it makes sense i mean it never hurts to be optimistic nope it doesn't <laughs> what um you start turning the temps up and they're still in there they're going to stay in just because it's not that they only breed during the cooling period right no they, they continue to stay together um, and again, it's, it, it, it's a different process for me because I have so many, I'm not gonna, even though I'm sure, you know, pairing number seven is done and she's, she's, you know, ovulated, she had her post ovulation shed, even though I'm sure she's done, I'm going to continue to put the male in and continue to go through the process every, you know, two or three weeks of, of sep separate to feed, um, pull all the males, put them all back in their cages, in their tubs, um, take all the trios and and figure out which one's which and put it back in its appropriate case and put the plug in the middle so they can't get through and feed everybody and then when that a few days after they're done feeding i go back through the process of reintroducing all the males um i could easily not put the male in that i believe the female is done but at the same time that just adds a complexity a layer of complexity to what i'm doing that could you know, mess me up and, and make me put the wrong male in with the wrong female, et cetera, et cetera. So I just continue to put them all together until I've decided that that I'm done dealing with it for the year. When yeah. I think that I'm going to pull the, pull the plug and say, okay, we're done. Is that like in February or June? Oh, that's more like in probably February, March, I guess. Okay. And, and some of that, you know, it, it's, it's, again, I, I watch them all. I have individual record cards on each animal. I have a breeding record card um, for that year for that pair or trio. Um, and so I keep track of that and I know how much I'm seeing and, and I can, by recording it all and I put it all in a spreadsheet and I'm looking at it and playing with it and I can see that activity level drop off. And when I get to the point where I believe the activity level has dropped off to the point where there's nothing left to do, that's when I pull them apart. Gotcha. Um, I want to circle back to talking about feeding. Uh, you talked about um, keeping them together, or excuse me, uh, moving them to, to feed and then reintroducing them. Um, do, do you feed as normal when they're breeding? Do you slow it down? Do you feed the males and the females the same? What about that, that process? Once they're already together, what's feeding like for days? Once they're already together, it goes to once every two to three weeks. Um, I, I vary my feeding all you know, already, so I don't. It's not like you know every two weeks they get a rat. Yeah. No, it's sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's you know, and and, and some of that's based on the rat production because I raise my own rats. Um, if I'm short on rats, well then I can't feed everybody. If I'm uh, overstocked on rats, well then everyone gets a nice tasty meal. Um, so some some of that does affect how long that timing happens on an individual feed cycle. But yeah, I, I pull them apart um, to feed so that there's none of this. Um, both going after the same rat at the same time kind of deal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wait a few days so that they get, you know, away from that, you know, they each smell like a rat, so they don't have rat breath. And then uh, um, put them back together and off they go again. Now, what about um, in the leading up to the, the pairing process? Uh, I've spoken to a, a number of folks who said that it's, you know, starting even last month is a good time to really sort of uh, increase the feed for females. Do you ever increase the feed cycle oh, for yeah. females? Absolutely. I mean, I've been increasing the, the feed and watching the feed even, even months ago for the yeah. ones that I'm, I'm sure, the, the ones that weren't bred this last year, those are, are prime candidates for this year. Ones that weren't bred last year are prime candidates for ones to breed this coming year, um, along with others that haven't eaten, but those are kind of different because those are still in the breeding cages. But yeah, they're definitely been, you know, upping the food and, 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 and increasing the frequency, you know, work to, you know, bulk up the females some. 
Right, and, and that makes sense. Uh, what you, you mentioned, um, you know, the females that hadn't been bred last season, and uh, you know, bulking up the females for this season, the prime candidates. What what sort of signs do you look for? I mean, it's it's probably not as as obvious as a male drop in sperm plug, but what sort of signs would you look for in a female? Maybe body condition. How would you describe that? What you know for for if a female is is at the right age or right size or right season? Well, it, it it's a basic combination of age and size, um, and 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 yes, body structure does come into it because you know a large, long female that's skinny and still has some decent weight to her is not a necessarily a good breeding candidate. Um, whereas a um, an older female that never was a really big girl might not have a lot of weight on her, mm -hmm. but she's got you know good solid body weight, um, good girth to her. Um, she's a good candidate. She's never going to be, you know, just like people, you know, there we're all, we all come in different sizes and shapes. Um, and, and that just because it's a smaller female doesn't mean it's not a good breeder. Um, it does likely mean that she's not going to have a large litter. Um, also means she might have smaller babies, um, but that's all stuff we can deal with. That makes sense. So, but, um, you know, a lot yeah. of factors that all come into it at the same time. You can't really just say, oh, this is the, the the golden rule that says, you know, if, if it weighs this much and it's this long and it's this big around, it, it, that's the one to breed. Right. So it's a you're telling me it's a case by case basis, and I have to review each snake and and season individually. Yep. I hate that. <laughs> what well, and, and, and and part of it, you know, I'm looking at it as a, you know a, a a larger breeder. I have a large collection. And I'm starting out with, you know, 40, 50, 60 candidates to breed, and I'm going to weed it down to 30. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, those are obvious. Those will go away. These are, these are obvious. These goes, those go in. And then there's this group in the middle, and I'm going to pick and choose which ones are, are, are the better candidates, I feel, are the better candidates, and come up with my 30 breeding females. And, you know, it's not necessarily exactly 30 all. It's you know mm -hmm. somewhere in that vicinity, um, and when I come up with once I come up with those that list of females that are going to breed, breed um, I then take their individual. I have a breeding record card. It's on a three by five. It has the information about the animal and I out on the table, and then I come with my males and I sit there and sort and shuffle and move and 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 down with the, this is the the way everything's going to go together. And then how long do you keep them together? What, what sort of signs are you looking for before you remove them? I know you touched on it. Um, I'm looking for a lack of activity. Um, I'm also watching you know, previous activity. On any individual day, you'll see something. You'll see, oh, they're, they, got, they got their tails running each other or, or maybe the, the female is swollen and, and yesterday. Um, there's all kinds of different things you'll see. So on any individual day, you'll get you'll get one piece of the puzzle, and of course that one piece of the puzzle, you know, a damn puzzle looks like in the end. Um, but what you're looking for is as you get these pieces, start laying the table and you're um, as you start laying them out and you look at it, you can see okay they made it, you know, several times over the period of a month. And then they stop, and then, and, and by stop me, a few weeks they stop me. And a few weeks after that, she sheds. That's a perfect pairing. That's a perfect sequence of events that leads up to say that that shed that she had, you know, about a month and a half after the last mating, um, and you know, some more, some more, some less. It's never don't have a man know exactly what they're yeah. supposed to do so they just do this all by gut instinct but about a month and a half after that last noted mating is when she's going to shed and that's her post ovulation shed you might miss because they're not real obvious and it happens real quick and kind of goes away within a day or so and, and at that point you're not seeing um uh so so you're not like you said the ovulation happens quick so you may miss that especially in a you know, a nocturnal snake that likes to hide. Um, but you'll notice the shed in the in the enclosure. You'll be able to, to pick that out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you were just saying um, regarding the ovulation. So they're not, 
coming back up here and stumbling over my words. So they're not going, when they get to that post ovulation step, they're not still locking up at this point, right? Or, or does that ever sometimes? No, no they, 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 they only, they are not people. They don't make for the fun of it. They make only to reproduce and, and create offspring. Male is only attracted to the female when a female is putting off her so i'm ready right. and as soon as she ovulates those pheromones go away and the, the male no longer is, is scenting that now there it, it isn't you know a light switch it doesn't flick on and off so i mean obviously there's going to be some some uh, pheromones still in the air sure and there could be pheromones from another cage even but you know he's that there's a female ready and i'll hear and it's like well, she doesn't quite smell right, but close enough kind of deal. And so he might still be pastoring her, but she's she's not receptive. She's not allow her tail to go in a position where he can wrap on it. And um, so, yeah, they'll pretty much when once she once they stop mating, they pretty much go to the corners and leave each other alone. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, example of, of a successful pairing, but uh, Eric asked a question, says, have you ever paired a male and female that won't walk tails? How long will you leave them together before you decide it's not gonna happen? Until I'm done with all of them. And I mean, I see that every year, that, that you know, some pairings just, you know, aren't meant to be. Um, whether the female, you know, never, you know, isn't ready to cycle, whether the male isn't ready to cycle, that's all, all factors that can go into it. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, I, I get pairings where they, they never show each other any attention whatsoever. And I also have those same pairings that babies show up Yeah, <laughs> three so months later, you know, it was more of a, uh, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I'm done successful. And you never see it happen, you know, cause again, you're not sitting there watching them 24 seven. No, I go in and check them in the morning. I check them in the evening, especially, you know, breeding season. I try and leave them alone as much as I can. So, you know, sometimes you don't see it. And sometimes they just, no, nope, I don't like her. How long, uh, how long will they stay locked up? I've heard some people say exactly that, that it's, uh, it's I must have missed it at some point during the night. And then other people say, um, uh, you know, th this animal was paired for five days and locked up the whole time. So, so do they, will they stay locked up for days at a time or is it, what's, what's they the can. case with that? They can. And sometimes, you know, the, the the locking up process is the male um, spurring the female and part of that spurring the female. And again, this is all my, my take on it. So it's not, I'm not a professional at this. I'm not an expert at this, but you know, I've done it enough that I've got some, some reasonable experience with it, but the male is spurring the female. And part of that spurring the female is um, I'm sure to excite the female but also to indicate that, well, here's the spur. So wherever this is, this is where my parts are. Mm. So you help and you align your parts with my parts because when, when, when you feel that spurring, you know that that's where I wanna, that that's where my stuff is. Mm -hmm. And so you wanna get your stuff near that. And then the male has his, has his tail wrapped around the female you know, with, with his hemipene, hemipene his, his cloaca around here. He's got the wrapped around the female, right around her. And then he's pulsing his hemipene out, trying to jam it into the female. Um, it's a very forceful kind of thing. He's trying to, you know, force his way in. And of course the mm -hmm. female, it will never happen until the female opens her clo cloaca and allows it to happen. But then once he gets in, I believe that process is fairly quick. Gotcha. Okay, so that makes sense. Most, the of the, most of what you see is the, the male trying to get lined up to make the, 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 the to, sh to shoot his goal. Yeah, so it could, um, it's all foreplay. <laughs> I was going to say uh, it's, it's all uh, courting, but it's, uh, it's, it's probably even a little bit after that. Um, and so that could last a long time or, you know, sometimes that's very quick and, and just business, right? Right. Um, well, I mean, and you think yeah. about it in the wild. One of the other things that I see with the mating um, is the female will leave urates all over the cage, smears of urates, not like what you're used to. You know, a pellet comes out. Is you, this when she's a, receptive or during the, the, the parent? 
as she is coming into cycle. Yeah. And you think about it from a, from a wild snake perspective. I love this, um, yeah, always. They don't live in the same tree. No, yeah. They live on their own. And in fact, they don't even live in one tree. They, they, they cruise the, the jungle and they find a spot to, to hang out for the night. And then, you know, the next time they leave, they, they, they don't necessarily have a den that they come back to every time. And so the female's cruising through the jungle and she's starting to feel her, her, her cycle coming on. And she wants a male to, to come take care of that business so that she can do her, her natural born thing, which is to make more babies. Mm -hmm. um, well, how do you get the male to find you? Because the male's not living with you in, in one small enclosure. No, the male is in this jungle with you. And of course, you know, could be miles away. So she's leaving this scent trail. Now, of course, when it's in a cage, she's leaving a scent trail and then crawling through it over and over and over again. But out in the wild, she'd be cruising through the jungle, going from point A to point B and leaving a little scent trail. So the male comes across that scent trail and goes, oh, this way and follows the female and it catches up with her and then mates. You well, there's that? a timing to that too. Yeah. And so in, in captivity, he's gonna come across that scent trail as soon as you put him in the cage. She may not be quite ready. She might be you know, dropping that scent trail or leaving that scent trail ahead of time to try and get the male to find it and catch up to her by the time she is ready. No, that makes a lot of sense. Do you, um, do you clean up the, the females cages around this time? I clean them on a regular basis, just like I would any other time. Um, she will, as soon as you clean it up, she'll start leaving more. Uh -huh. it, it's not like she ever stops leaving the scent trail. She's always, she's always smearing a little here, smearing a little there, whether you clean it up or not. It, obviously, if you don't clean it up, there's just more and more and more spots because, you know, she's, cruises this way and sure. cruises that way. Of course, it's in, it's in a small cage. He's just, you know, going all over her trails over and over again. Um, Eric asks, he says, I, know, I noticed an unusually high amount of urate smeared around her enclosure shortly after they were paired. No lock yet. Um, Eric, was that uh, this year or, or in previous years? Um, and Yevi Ostro also asked, uh, what size tub do you use for female breeders? And uh, Evi, Dave answered that earlier. He likes to keep the, the males in tubs, the, the females he puts in cages, not totally unlike what's behind me, um, something that he can see without having to slide the, the tub out. Right, Dave? Right. And you use, uh, is it animal plastics enclosures? Yeah, I use, I use, uh, uh, I use uh, animal plastics enclosures and I use the Iris CB110 tubs um, in racks um, for holding storage of you know males and females, so that you know it, it's it's a, even bigger than the uh, um, Sterilite underbed box. It's about three square feet of floor space. It's only six inches tall, but I use racks of those um, to house individual animals not being bred. Gotcha. And then once they're breeding, you move them into your through your great migration. You move them into the the breeding cages and yeah. The females stay in the breeding cages. Um, there's always a set of females in the breeding cages, whether they're um, right, like currently right now, it's the ones that were bred last year, whether they had babies or not. Um, and then there's a, a, a stack of tw two stacks of 10 or 20 females um, sitting off to the side in the CB110 tubs that are you know, prime candidates for 2023. Um, not all of those will be selected for 2023, but that gives me a good start towards the towards the 30. And uh, let me uh, ask, ask you a question and see if I can't answer it uh, myself with just by assuming it, is the reason why you keep them in, in, you have basically a separate cage for them to breed in. Is that because um, essentially not every female is going to be going every year and, and you only have so many cages to, to use for the pairing or is it uh, an efficiency deal or Yep, that's a totally efficiency. The yeah. you know the, the the cages take up more space, and you know it's a uh, in the same footprint you get ten females um, versus you get you know twenty in storage. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it takes up a it it had and you get and you can see them. You know you've got the glass doors you can look in, and even though they're always misted over um, water condensation on the inside, you yeah. can you can see in and see what's going on. 
Uh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I mean, for someone with a much smaller uh, scale operation, um, if each animal has their own permanent cage, there'd be no need to move them into a separate cage to breed. Just yeah. Pop for me, pop for me, you know, it, it's economy of space. I, I only have so much space. Yeah. I, mean, I have a lot of animals, and, and you know, I can't um, keep so many. If I had only cages, uh, I'd have half as many animals. Yeah, yeah, and it makes sense uh, for the, the the type of operation that you're trying to run. Um, uh, so after, let me say, we've had the, the post-ovulation shed, right? You've decided to remove the animals. Um, now what? What do you look for in the female? Um, well, I look for the female to, to, to give me babies eventually. Yeah. Um, I, I've worked out the timeline myself. No one had worked it out prior that, that I know of. Um, so I, I basically look at this and I know that 124, 127 days later that after the post ovulation shed is when their due date is and that due date is plus or minus 10. So I'm literally, you know, making notes on the cage that, you know, this one's due on such and such date. And, you know, 10 days before that, um, I drop a wire screen into the water bowl just in case she has her babies in the water that the babies have something to, some, some traction to get out of the water bowl. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but in, in that meantime, I'm offering food. Um, I'm hoping to see things, you know, the things I hope to see in, in the individual animals is she starts refusing food. That's, that's a big plus that, you know, as soon as she starts refusing food, that's a good indication that she's crabbing. Um, as it progresses, she gets bulkier and bulkier and, and, you know, the, 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 the almost hilarious part, and I don't weigh them specifically to, to know this, but it, it's obvious as heck that the female is gaining weight and she's not eating. Mm -hmm. How's that happen? She's absorbing water and mm -hmm. the babies are absorbing water. So you don't get to see how much she drinks, but that water is going into making the amniotic fluid and, and, you know, and those, those eggs growing inside her absorbing nutrients and absorbing water through the shell through the membrane mm -hmm. and so all that you know additional water is going into into play as opposed to eating a rat and, and digesting it and becoming more snake that way right and getting the protein and, and the nutrition i mean that makes sense too and if you think of uh, i don't know what percentage snakes are of water but they say the human body is what like 70 percent so if a female's got 15 to 30 babies inside her, that's a lot of water she's going to have to absorb yeah. to, to make up those babies. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. That's a, that's a really good um, good observation that I I don't think I've ever heard that before. Yeah, um, I've been doing this a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's why I wanted you on, Dave. We can learn a thing or two from you. Um, so let's say uh, let's say she's gravid. She's successful. She goes through the whole thing. She's healthy. She has a litter of babies. Well, first off, is it litter or clutch? It's, it's always up for debate. Uh -huh. and, and the funny part is, as someone who has done this for years, I have seen both sides. I have seen many, more so, most, uh, babies come out still in their egg, still in their egg. It's, it's a membrane. It's kind of like a chicken egg has that, that, that thin membrane inside. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a thicker, heavier membrane than that, but that's all there is. There's no outer shell. I've seen them come out in that membrane completely intact. I've also seen them come out outside the membrane. Mm -hmm. So the reality is they have laid eggs and they've also given live birth to babies. I've, I've witnessed both. So live birth to babies would be uh, a litter, whereas bunch of eggs laid that even if they hatch immediately she still laid eggs it's a clutch right so i call so, it litter so the litter or a clutch um the litter or a clutch. i call it litter. okay because uh, it, because uh, they're considered live birth it, it feels right when you say litter but then again I, I i've never really found it that odd when you say clutch either because it is such a, a unique um sort of phenomenon you know well it's it's, still re reproduction via uh, a, an egg process Right. There is no connection between the egg and the mother inside. The egg is completely disconnected. Um, it is no absorbing placenta. nutrients and water through the membrane, but there's no there's no umbilical cord. Yeah. Um, it's there's no placenta. It's just straight up eggs inside of her. She's just the incubator. Yeah. 
No, that's fascinating. And then, um, so that's a good question. And, and we talked about raising the heat, but uh, you mentioned incubation and I think incubation temps are so critical. What, um, what temperatures do you expect uh, the females? You said normally um, you, they have a basking shelf in your enclosures, right? They have a basking shelf. And you said in the other interview that, you know, usually you see them hanging out right underneath the radiant heat panel on that basking mm -hmm. shelf, right? What, well, what, two things. They'll either yeah, be on, the, on the, the basking shelf, which is kind of underneath the, the, the radiant heat panel. Yeah. Or when they really want to get warm, they'll literally be perched on the lip of the water bowl right underneath, almost you know, touching the, the, the radiant heat panel and you know, sucking up the heat that way. I, again, that radiant heat panel has been raised back to the same 82 degrees that I keep all the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but that 82 degrees is measured on the back wall, whereas the radiant heat panel, I'm sure is getting up to 85 or so. Yeah. Um, and, but it allows them just like, just like everything else, they thermoregulate. And, and when she wants more heat, she has the ability to go somewhere and get more heat. Um, Again, what works for me. Gotcha. No, that's good to know. And um, yeah, because I, I, I think that's so important. You know, you take eggs out and you put them in an the incubator, you know exactly what's going on. But here the mom is carrying the eggs with her and she can go all around. So if you don't provide that right temperature zone for her, uh, then she's frankly not going to happen. And yeah, the, 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 the typically gravid females are either up on the shelf or on the rim of the water bowl all the time. And they don't move. They're, you know, they'll just find a spot and they'll be there and they'll, they'll sit there for you know weeks on end. Um, when they start to move, is when you know the babies are getting ready to come. They have that you know that nesting instinct. And they start moving around. They drop their waxy stool, which is their their mucus plug, um, similar to a human birth, and uh, um, you clearing the pipes for the babies to come out, and then. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had any issues with the uh, egg binding or the stillbirth being stuck in the females? There's the only issue that I've ever seen that I've run into is um, slugs. Mm -hmm. And slugs are an unfertilized egg. Well, that unfertilized egg turns into this little potato. Um, they're kind of that orangish color. They're, they're solid, they're, they're firm. I mean, it's not like a rock hard, but they're definitely, you know, not like a pliable baby. Yeah. And the moms have a hard time passing those. Not a really hard time. It's not even really bigger than any poop they pass. Um, maybe a little bit bigger around. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a hard poop. It'd be like a harder poop for them to pass. Hmm. Um, but the problem that happens, and I've seen this happen over and over again, and again, this is just my years of ob observation, is the applying the pressure, the contractions to push this slug and get it out the cloaca is much harder than pushing a baby. With a baby, they kind of push and the, the, the egg sac starts to come out. It blows this little bubble of egg sac and fluids filling that up. And then as it's blowing up that bubble, obviously the cloaca is expanding because there's bubbles in there. And then, then it's big enough for the baby start passing through. And all of a sudden this baby starts passing through into the bubble. And then, you know, from there it pushes out pretty quickly. It comes out and then the rest of the sac comes out with it. Whereas the slug is pushing really hard and it has to push really hard to get to that point where the slug is pushed just out enough to get past that thickest part of the slug and then it can pass. That takes a lot more pressure. And what I have seen and observed several times is that one or more babies behind that slug have ruptured sacs. So they, you know, they rupture the sac while trying, they rupture the sac of a baby while trying to push a slug out. Mm. And those are the babies that are born still. Really? Because they, they probably drown. There or probably was a slug them. ahead of them and they drown inside the mom while the mom's trying to push everything out. And those typically are the ones that are still. And that to me is a great explanation of why you have this perfectly formed baby that's not alive when it's on the ground, but had to have been alive inside mom An hour just recently. Yeah. Um, interesting. And then, so once the babies are on the ground, how do you remove them? Do you do it right away? Do you wait? Do they stay with mom? Well, they're born in mostly in sacks. 
Mm -hmm. um, it takes them anywhere from a couple of minutes to a few hours to decide to come out of that sack. Um, depending on the litter and, and how it's born, there's, you know, the full term litter, they'll come out relatively quickly and they'll be cruising around. And uh, for the most part, I only grab them out once they've come out of the sack and they've um, severed their, their umbilical to the, to the yolk nodule. Um, that's left and you know that's as they slither off they just they go forward and the egg doesn't and it, mm -hmm. it stretches and stretches and pops and you know again it's just a natural process bleeds a little and then uh, but at, once they've separated themselves from their own yolk then they're fair game for me to pluck out and throw in i have uh, sweater box tubs with whole, with paper towels all all dampened down and i put like 10 babies in a tub at a time and uh, so I'll separate them as soon as I see that they're on their own, ready to go. Um, a lot of times while this is happening, I've already pulled the female and put her in another one of those tubs without a uh, paper, wet paper towel because she doesn't need the damp paper towel. And just to, just for me to get her out of the way so I don't have to worry about her and, mm -hmm. and being defensive. Because so is, that, she, is she a little extra defensive over her babies at this time? Oh, the hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that happens quite a bit. So, uh, I, I, for the most part, I don't reach in to grab a female away from her babies without a glove. Without a glove, right. I was going to ask yeah. if you used like a shield and lance going in there. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, so, it's, many times they're totally fine and you, you can pick them up. And, you know, I, I uh, obviously, I've, again, I've been doing this a little while. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I look in the cage and I open the door and I, I have a sense of how she is. And if she is, you know, raised up and ready to, ready to defend her babies against all comers, well, then the glove comes on mm -hmm. and uh, pull her out. And the funny part is, is with the glove on, she almost, they will almost never bite. Yeah. Because I think, again, one of those targeting sensors is it takes away the heat. So, so they don't sense the heat. So you're just a moving stick. You're not a hand, you're not a, a predator. Yeah, that's, uh, that's got to be a little different for them, you know, because uh, everything that's coming after them is a warm-blooded animal just about or, or another yeah. reptile. Um, uh, interesting. So Rebecca has a question. She wanted to know, is there a particular method you use to determine which animals to pair, aside from age, size, physical condition? Um, so aside from being ready, do you look for animals that have complementary or similar traits um, besides being of the same morph? So is it, what, what are the, what are the decision-making processes? Uh, what are the key points that you choose to, to make your decisions on for who you're pairing up? Well, uh, yes, absolutely. You're looking for animals that you think are going to go well together. Some of that, for example, Gwen and Wendell have produced you know, outstanding babies in the past. So anytime Gwen's ready to go, Wendell's going to be with her because, you know, ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. um, the breeding opportunities aren't, they don't come along all, every year. Um, so you don't want to, I, I personally don't want to waste waste or can use a breeding cycle on a high color animal that I know is going to produce animals and babies that are absolutely stunning. Um, unless I have a specific plan to do something else with it. So, you know, there's a lot of these pairings like Gwen Wendell, it's like, okay, it's Gwen's going, Wendell's going with her. Um, and since Wendell's a stunning male, what other female is going to go with them uh, is, as a trio? Because again, I love you know, what Wendell does. And so we're going to do more with him. Um, there are pairings like that. And then there are also pairings like I'm doing, uh, you know, for example, a project to, to create uh, a snow. Um, obviously, the animals that are in the snow project would be a total waste to breed it to a normal. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you're trying to outcross um, and you know create out outcrossed animals to put back into the project, uh, you're wasting your time to breed a double het snow to a normal because mm -hmm. then you're going to end up with babies that are all you know 50 percent het awesome. for both traits. Um, so again, you know, you have different groups of animals that you're going to put together for different reasons. And uh, for me, it, it, there's, there's the obvious ones, you know, the double het snow with the, with in, in, in a grouping with other animals in that project and, and then figuring out which ones you're gonna do for that. And then those get set aside. 
And, and are I you calling, this. sorry to cut you off, Dave, are you calling snow, is that a, the albino and the anery? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, technically, I believe I've already produced one. Oh? Stillborn. Oh. Well, actually, it wasn't stillborn, it was premature and clearly so premature it wasn't going to survive. And it, I gave it every chance I could, but it didn't survive. It was completely white. So that's what I was going to ask. So the, uh, the that's I want to see how it came out because the anery is a reduction of red pigment, um, and then the albinos we've seen um, the takes away the black, takes yeah, away the, and the melanin. non the, the the true albino, not the the caramel, uh, which I guess I shouldn't say true albino because it's just a different type of albino. But it's uh, you see these animals and they're pink white pink. with pink and orange and red, so it's like that's all they have is red. So yeah, you said it came out and it was just an all white stillborn. Yep. The only red it had, you could see, was the 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 blood vessels inside. Uh, what color were the eyes? Um, I have to look Remember? at the picture. I think yeah. it was it was you know again. I think it was just no color. Interesting. Um, it, was, it was pretty freaky. Is <laughs> pretty it, cool. is is there anything uh, you're excited about this breeding season? That I'm, yeah. I'm 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 it'll be my next attempt at producing a snow, and oh. we've started to. Uh, narrowed down some of the possible, you know, I started with the uh, het anery, 50% het albinos last year. Mm -hmm. um, I have known double hets this year, um, along with the, the het anery, 50% het albinos, which we've at least identified two as being het albino. Um, I think I've identified a male as being not het albino and leaving two of the two females he was with is still past het albinos. Um, so again, it's just, you know, gonna be sitting there mixing and matching and deciding what to do. And uh, so again, back to the original question, that'll take a group of animals out and, and, and a group of cages, you know, set aside for that. And then there's gonna be things, you know, other things that I'm working on, like even just the high color stuff because everyone loves the high color animals. Um, so, so that will be decide some pairings and, and, and you look at, you're gonna to wanna to breed a high red to a high red, not necessarily a high red to a high orange. Mm -hmm. But again, if you're down to the point where you got this, you know, what you got left is a high red and a high orange, I'll put them together. Mm -hmm. see what happens um and that's and some of that's even based on you know the past if if, if you bred a pair of animals together and they didn't do well we're well, not going to breed that pair of animals together again they didn't produce you know outstanding babies i'm not here to produce average normal babies i'm here to produce stunning draw jaw dropping oh my god animals well and, and you have said to me uh one of the one of my favorite uh, lines when it comes to this industry and this hobby and you said you decided a long time ago that you wanted to be the breeder that you wanted to buy from and mm -hmm. i know you mean that with uh, not only the quality of the animals but also with uh, just the way that you care for them and, and uh, responsibilities and uh, those sort of things as well right oh yeah no it's i i i, I a lot of what I do. I mean, the fact that, I mean, here's the, here's the pile of babies from this year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Each one of those. I've already set animal. some out. So this isn't all of them. This is individual record cards for every single one. Those are the ones that are still at your facility. This is the ones still, still physically at my house. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so there, there, a number of those are available. A number of them are growing up as part of projects, or are they yep. all available? Well, a number of them are available. There's a, there's some born later in the year that are, aren't quite available yet. They're right on that cusp. I, I, I raise mine up to second shed before I even offer them up to second shed, and obviously everything's going well mm -hmm. um, before I allow them to be sold. So there's still some that are where the whole litter hasn't quite gotten to second shed, although we're right on the cusp of that. Gotcha. The um, last litters. Now, I, I don't always, I, I try not to, to get into the, the conversation of money um, about the cost of things. This is something we didn't discuss in the last one, but something that makes me uh, curious sort of, or, or about the interest in the, the, the the market is the sort of opportunity for investment or the idea of, um, you know, doing this as a, as a subsidy for, for the hobby and that sort of thing. And I know a lot of folks do like to invest in high-end snakes. So if, do you have any idea what this, something like the snow morphs would be going for if, uh, if you produced any of those? No clue. No clue. 
my 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 again as the breeder that I would want to buy from, mm -hmm. I'm not breeding to a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. I am breeding what I want. And when I have it in my hot little hands and I'm ready to sell it, then I have to come up with a price to put on it. Mm -hmm. I don't price my babies when they're born. I don't say, oh, I just had this twenty thousand dollar litter. You know, I, I'm not into the. Uh, yes, the money is great. Yes, the money allows me to continue to do this. Um, no, if anyone's thinking about doing this and making money doing it, uh, good luck. <laughs> that was uh, on our very first panel that we had. I remember bringing that up, and uh, I said, "How do you, how do I make money breeding rainbow bows?" And, and the general consensus was just everyone laughed, <laughs> and they yeah. said, "You know, you'll uh, you'll make your money back at best." You know, and. Uh, yeah. And, and you can, I mean, I, I, I'm a prime example. You can make money producing and selling rainbow boas. Yeah. This is my full-time job. Am I making bank? No. Am I making as much as I used to working for corporate America? No. Mm -hmm. um, in effect, am I making as much? Yes, because I'm working for myself. I have my own business. I get to write everything off under the sun. And so I don't have to make as, mu make as much money to have as much money. So this is a good question, um, and uh, Rebecca, we've, we've talked about this too, and uh, I'd love to hear your thought on this, that uh, Rebecca asked Dave, where do you see the Brazilian rainbow boa market heading? Do you see a trend in certain animals being more, more in demand? Uh, some of that's already been identified. The, the high color animals are, I can't, I can't produce enough. I can't keep them on the shelf. Um, I had a small litter that was really bright colored animals. They, they sold out almost instantly. Um, so the high color animals is definitely a market. There are more and more people out there that want to try and get into some of this higher end stuff. And they're willing to drop the coin that it takes to do that. Will they be successful? I don't know. Um, I have a buyer recently that I know have bought from me and bought from other breeders. And he's bought a lot of individual high end animals. Mm -hmm. And of course, I don't know exactly what all he's bought. But from what I can see, he's bought, you know, very attractive high-end animals, but not necessarily in a group that would breed together. Sure. So I'm, I think he might be trying to, you know, start his collection and get the females more so up front, which is a smart thing to do. Um, and then come back around and pick up some males later. But, you know, yeah, I mean, there's definitely... You know, a lot of people doing this and, and more and more people doing it. And the more people do it, the more attractive and fancy they get. I mean, I, I go to shows and I had rainbow bows aren't necessarily, you know, the best show animal to sell. Um, it's not a ball python. Mm. Those seem to sell left and right. The other thing that sells at the shows are the, you know, the lower cost animals. So mm. the rainbow bows aren't flying off the shelf at the shows. Um, but I have numerous people at every show walk by and, and, and they're just, you know, their jaws are dropping at how gorgeous these animals are. Um, more so than anywhere else they see because they have all this color. I think a lot of people are scared too. I, I mean, um, we've, uh, as a hobby, done a lot to kind of assuage the, the myth that as soon as you bring a rainbow bow home, it's going to die. But you still catch that a lot at, at shows and, and from new customers bit, where people say, bit. I'm going to kill the snake, right? Well, I mean, and my answer is yes, they are a moderate care level snake. They're not, it's not a, you know, corn snake. It's not something that you can turn loose in the house and find it a year later and it's, it's just fine. Um, it's something that's going to require some, the proper setup and you get the proper setup and the proper and get the proper parameters around the animal and they absolutely thrive. You don't, they won't. Well, I want to know when we're going to see albino candy stripes. That may be a while. Yeah? That may be a while. Um, I'm still working at getting my albinos up to breeding size. Gotcha. Um, I don't want to get into breeding possets and saving possets and doing projects with possets because I'm, even though I'm still doing it, um, it's kind of my last take at that because I don't it, the process is it's just it's a real pain in the ass especially if you raise something raise and pain. then yeah find out it doesn't prove out and then okay now what do you do it's four years and, down the drain 
Well, and it takes a lot more animals. And so you, you've got, you know, a half dozen posets to get three heads. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully it's, it's not all females or all males. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's a, a comment Eric had responded earlier. He said that he would have uh, recently messaged you uh, and admitted his impatience with this process. And um, I think you would agree with me uh, when I say that I, I think keeping snakes has been the ultimate teacher of patience for me. Um, oh, because yeah. they, they don't do anything right away. Um, yeah. even and sometimes... rainbow boas are, are even slower. Oh I mean, ball gosh. pythons, they can crank them out in you know, a year and a half, two years. You know, they're cranking out the next generation. Um, you can't do that with rainbow boas. Mm -hmm. You can do it in three years, uh, cradle to maternity ward. Um, mm -hmm. But that's with pushing animals and, and raising them faster than, they, than is healthy for them. Yeah. Um, I find it usually takes around five years for a generation. And yeah, it takes a lot of patience. And if you don't have the patience, you might as well not get into them as a breeder. As a pet owner, sure. But not as a someone trying to produce and do something and 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 it's not a get rich quick scheme by any means. No. But it's a, it's a it, it might be a get poor quick scheme if uh, if you have enough fun with it. Um, it's it's been a blast, Dave, and, and I think your information has been just overall, uh, as always, and for the third time or, or second time that we've done the full interview, uh, just fantastic. And, and, and I've learned so much, folks. If you guys have any questions, uh, type them in now, because as I'm rambling here, it's, it's going to be the end of it unless you get it in. Um, uh, do you have anything you wanted to add on to, Dave? Anything you felt like we didn't touch upon or, or that you're hoping to get out? Well, uh, I think we pretty much covered it all. Um, I'm always here to give out information i mean i've i've also referred to myself as a little johnny rainbow seed you know, planting <laughs> my seeds and uh I, I definitely don't expect all to to uh, uh mature into anything um but you know i'm people ask and i inform that's the way i've always been with it again the breeder i'd want to i'd want to buy from well not I the guy not the guy who sells you the snake and disappears right and that's it too. Um, you, you're an admin for the Brazilian Rainbow Boa Group on Facebook, and um, everyone can find you on there. Um, and you're, you're active, and you're always answering questions, and you've answered a million of mine. Um, Rebecca says thank you so much. She'll always bug you when she has a question. Uh, Terrell J asked any tips on feeding Leos. Um, so that's a good question. You're feeding oh. the the brand new babies. Feed them small. Great question, Terrell. So you said feed them small, like what? Like like a. Um... My babies are on large fuzzies. Mm -hmm. They could take hoppers, but again, they're all individual animals. And many of them will do just fine taking hoppers. But there are some that you feed them hoppers and they're gonna regurge because it's too much of a meal for them. And once you go into a regurge, then you're, you're fighting it and trying to get that animal to recover. And as a person that has 140 babies right now mm -hmm. um, that I'm taking care of, that bandwidth to remember, oh, this one over in tub number 17, I need to take care right. of or make a note on or whatever. For me, I find it's better to just go on the smaller side of feeding and they grow slower, um, but they still grow. Mm -hmm. And they're much less likely to regurge or have any issues if you feed them slowly. It's just like people, you know, you, you that that once a year at Thanksgiving and you stuff yourself to the to the brim and then later you're going, oh, I wish I hadn't eaten so much. Mm. Well, you don't want to be doing this to the rainbow boas and 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 doing it every week. The you know the other thing is and, and one of my favorite stories of all time. I've had you know a lot of babies over the years, thousands literally, um, and when you have that many babies, you're gonna have some babies that don't appear to thrive as well from the beginning. Um, in the past, I had done things like assist feeding, force feeding um, to get them started and that seemed to work. And then one year I, I had one that, that didn't wanna eat. Um, and I decided, okay, we're, we're gonna kind of run an experiment. And I know it's in some ways it doesn't sound um, so nice. Um, but I decided that this, this baby was either going to thrive on its own or not thrive on its own. 
And so I offered her food every week and she refused. And next week I offer her food and she refused. Four months later, that's 120 days-ish later, she ate her very first meal. Wow. Was it frozen thought or live? These were all live. So it wasn't, it wasn't the, the situation that where, you know, I wasn't feeding or something that she, you know, because trust me, I know live, they go after much better than frozen thawed. Um, many can be trans, most can be transitioned to frozen thawed with no problem, but they almost all do better if you start off with live. Mm -hmm. But this was live and this was, you know, four months later. Eric, to everyone, what age did it not eat for four months? until it was four months old. From zero to four months. From yeah. zero to four months. It had zero food by mouth. Yeah. I expected it might probably had a little bit of some yolk left over that yeah. absorbed. So, you know, the first period of time that it had some nutrition that was still being absorbed that way. But it went four months without eating. Once it took that first meal, it figured it, it, figured it out and started eating regularly after that. And it grew just fine from there. Of course, it was half the size of all its siblings because all its siblings have been eating all that time and growing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the point is, they're not going to starve to death anytime quick if there's not any underlying issues. You know, if it has a you know an organ failure or whatever, and that's why it's not eating, then no matter what you do, it's going to not survive. But without an underlying issue, they can a baby can go at least four months with no food. Uh, an adult can go easily the better part of a year with no food whatsoever, and not perish from it. Obviously, they're going to slim down over time, just like anyone on a diet. Um, but these are Feast or famine, opportunistic feeders. When food is plentiful and they don't have their own issue with eating, they'll eat and gorge themselves and grow and grow and grow. And when food is scarce, or none whatsoever, they survive. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done for millennia on their own. And they seem to be, they seem to do much better when allowed to do that. So skip a meal yeah. every once in a while. Well, that's, and that's fascinating. And I love what you said about your, um, your little experiment too, because I, I mean, a lot of accredited zoos and, and ACA institutions are, they're not going to go the extra step and, and help struggling animals feed because to them, the quality of the bloodline of the animal that they're trying to preserve in nature, it's it doesn't, you know, that doesn't play favorites. It, there's no assistance. So if the animal's not strong enough to do it, maybe those are genetics that aren't the best for pushing on anyways. And um, I don't know if we, we get into that so much as breeders because we, we kind of want to move them all and every life that we made is, is precious, right? But uh, I, I don't know. There, there's, I think there's, there's a big part of that. I've helped a lot of people uh, over Facebook Messenger who you know, couldn't get their babies to eat. And they've asked me, gosh, how do you, it makes me wonder how these animals even survive in the wild. And you know, the answer to that is, well, 98% of them don't, yeah. <laughs> you know? Maybe they don't even have their first meal because they're too afraid to uh, to come out and, and eat, or, uh, or or the other way, they're too brave looking for food and they get snatched up. So yeah. it's it's a wild world out there. Yeah, um, we'll twenty and be lucky if one survives. That's right. Yeah, out of twenty, that's not a big enough to to assure that one of them survives. So um, it's obviously very very different odds for us. Um, hopefully, and Dave, thank you so much for taking the time out of your week to do this. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, folks, thank you for attending and, uh, and showing up and good luck to everyone with your projects this year. Dave, good luck. I hope to see, uh, an all white baby uh, this summer. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, have a good uh, night and, and everyone else that attended. Thank you so much and, and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye.